Welcome to the Open Forum. Once again, we have the privilege and the opportunity to share from the Word of God. Our concern is for truth, and therefore we are constantly comparing Scripture with Scripture, knowing full well that what we have learned throughout our time in the churches, and I've spent a lot of time there, uh, uh, that much of what has been taught is not true to the Word of God. That, that God, particularly in our day, has revealed a great amount of new truth that has to be factored into what we already have learned uh, from a long time ago uh, during the church age. And uh, that comes very uh, harshly and in a very difficult way to people who are just in the churches because where did all these new ideas come from? What's, what's going on here? It's, it looks like someone is peddling their own ideas. No, it's because God has at this time in history opened another uh, a little book in the Bible. That is, it's all all been written there. But until God elects to begin to share it with us, we can't understand it. And now in our day, God is sharing that truth that was in that little book that uh, Daniel had heard from God 2,500 years ago. And he had been commanded to write it in the book, that's the Bible, and then seal it up for the time of the end. And because we are at the time of the end, now, lo and behold, we're understanding what was in that little book. And surprise, surprise, surprise. And we cannot trust what our churches are teaching any longer. That's the re one of the basic reasons why God has instructed us to get out of the churches and listen only to the Bible. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. And shall we take our next, our first call tonight, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Brother Campy. Yes. My question is regarding John 21.11. John 21.11. Let's look at that. John 21, 11. Simon Peter went up and drew their net to land full of great fish, a hundred and fifty-three. And for all there were in, were so many, yet was not the yet net broken. Now, what is your question? Well, the question is, um, in a Bible study, we had a question that came up about the 153 fish, why that numerical value to the fish. We understand the uh, whole fishing, uh, I say, fishing expedition was to prove that uh, we need Jesus in everything that we can do. Well, we can do nothing without him. But what was the, we thought of anybody who might know would be you regarding the numbers there. Well, you, you're very correct that this number, 153, was not put there incidentally or accidentally. After all, God could have said, and the net was filled with great fish, a, a large number. Why not that? Why 153 fish? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So there has to be a spiritual lesson in the number 153. Now, we have learned as we have been uh, uh, understanding how God wrote the Bible with more and more exactness that occasionally God uses words, and quite frequently he uses words to illustrate a spiritual meaning of some kind. Like, for example, you see the word blood, and you know it's talking about the life uh, where there's no salvation without the blood of Christ. That is, without Christ having given his life. We see the word fe uh, field, and we know that's a synonym for the world. And uh, and there's a word after word that uh, also has a, has a spiritual meaning. Well, numbers are also words, and, and the number 153... Uh, 
uh, we can't find that in the Bible to have any spiritual meaning. But when we've learned to break down a larger number to test it, and if it breaks down into significant prime numbers, then we can uh, then we can look for the spiritual meaning in those numbers. Uh, now this this number 153 breaks down into three times three times 17. And when we study the Bible, we know that the number three is used again and again and again spiritually to illustrate God's purpose. It is God's purpose. The number 17 is used in the Bible in significant places to illustrate those who are going to be taken to heaven. Now, it happens to be before we break down the number 153, we already know that that net represents the, the, the gathering of the final people who are becoming saved during this uh, last part of the Great Tribulation period. They're in a net that does not break. It is not brought into a ship because a ship in the Bible most of the time rep, uh, uh, there's a couple of words, but the kind of word that's used here is a, it means that it is uh, a reference to the local congregation. Uh, they, earlier on, for example, uh, er, the disciples let down the net, and the net was full of fish, and uh, yet me, the net broke, and only a, a, a part of them could get, were taken into the ship. That, and then we're brought to shore. Now, that was spiritually indicating that as we share the gospel as a church, uh, that uh, many seem to respond to the gospel, seem to have become saved, but then it uh, shows up very soon that they are terrors and not weak. Yet they are brought into the church, into the ship, and so uh, this is the methodology that God used through the church age. Well, now the, the fish are not able to come into the ship. They're dragged to shore uh, just by the apostles, and, uh, and the, uh, the ship is not uh, utilized at all. And that is the way it is during this final ingathering. God is not using the churches at all. He is gathering into his kingdom uh, those that he wishes to gather, and everyone that he wishes to gather does come in, and that does not break. And there, the number are, is 3 times 3 times 17. That is, it was God's purpose to bring these to heaven. 3 is purpose, 17 heaven. The fact that 3 is double, 3 times 3, that uh, carries even... Um, a lot more significance because the Bible teaches when a, when a dream or, or anything is doubled, it means that it is established by God and will shortly come to pass. And uh, thus God is saying, no. Uh, as we begin to understand that 153, this is established by God. It was his, it is his purpose that is sudden, shortly going to come to pass, that God is going to bring the final uh, people into heaven, which is happening in our day. Well, thank you. Thank you. We for appreciate call. it very much. Thank you thank for you. calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. How are you doing, Mr. Campen? Yes. Yeah, something about that 153. Uh, what about... Uh, the story with the captain and his 50 and the other captain and his 50, and then there was the third captain and his 50. Well, you know, God does not emphasize 153 there. He emphasizes 50 and and separates that from one. Now, first of all, there's one spiritual truth that shines through. You'll notice that two-thirds of those people, of those uh Soldiers that come to take came to take uh, uh, Elijah uh, uh, to the to the wicked king of Israel. Two thirds died, 
and uh, were were came under the wrath of God, and one third were spared, and that comes right out of Zechariah chapter 13, where it speaks about one third uh, being the uh, a, a representation of those who are believers, and two thirds a representation of those who are under the wrath of God, and uh, in, and uh, that's that's one of the meanings there. But uh, uh, God does not tie it all together as 153, even though it, if we add them all together, we get 153. But thank you Sorry. for calling and sharing. And shall we take... Uh, actually, there were 150 soldiers, and there was... Uh, uh, and there was... Uh, but... but uh, it really, the 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 focus really is on the the one third, two thirds, rather than on the one fifty, than uh, than on one fifty three. But shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Welcome. You know, it's like the number seventeen, when uh, when. Uh, uh, there were it was a terrible situation in in Jerusalem when uh, Nebuchadnezzar was ready to destroy the temple and just and break or destroy Jerusalem and then uh, the uh, 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 the prophet the the pro, the uh, pro, prophet uh, Jeremiah was told, uh, he was wondering, are we ever going to get back again? Because Jerusalem represented the kingdom of God. And uh, and God said uh, to buy a field that he could legitimately buy, that just anybody couldn't buy anybody's field. It had to be in a proper lineage, and he was in the proper lineage, to buy a field, and it was, he, it was instructed to pay 17 shekels of of uh, money, a second 17 shekels of silver for that field, uh, indicating that after the Israel would come back again to Jerusalem, uh, that it would be there and owned by Jeremiah or his his the, those who were properly uh, able to own it that were in his line indicating that, no, Jerusalem is not forever lost. It's going to be returned again. And that's very much like the kingdom of heaven. Right now, or we came to the end of the church age, and the kingdom of heaven was in a shambles. Virtually, virtually nobody was becoming saved because the churches that all had adopted a, a do-it-yourself salvation plan and yet God is insisting, no, there's still going to be a time of, of, of uh, many people becoming saved. That would be occurring during the last 6,100 days of the 8,400-day Great Tribulation. Uh, and uh, that was, I would uh, uh, tie in with the, uh, with the 153 fish. Uh, there, uh, the number 17 is featured again. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, Mr. Camping? Yes. Um, I have a question about the atonement. Uh, if Christ made the full payment for sin before creation, why would God during the whole Old Testament period command blood sacrifices be made for the sins of the people if the perfect sacrifice had already been made. That why been why would God command blood sacrifice to be made? You, after, see, after. you see, Christ spoke in parables. And the first parable is, or there are earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. And so throughout the Old Testament, we have all these ceremonial laws of lambs being slaughtered, oxen being slaughtered, uh, turtle doves, and we have blood. Uh, my, my, the temple was a place of blood. The blood was sprinkled on the base of the altar, and it must have been a very gory place because 
uh, and lambs were offered every single day. Uh, the priest really became a butcher par excellence because he butchered so many animals. And each animal, each shedding of blood was an earthly story pointing to the fact that to have remission of sin, a life had to be given. The blood of someone had to be shed, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. But it was a very, very dim shadow, a very dim uh, par parable. Uh, it, uh, it, it, it really very, very few, if anybody really understood what was really going on. Uh, maybe a few did, but most of them did not. So then God intensified the parable in an enormous way by sending Christ himself. Uh, when he came and went on and was uh, nailed to the cross, that was an enormous parable. That was a, that was a, 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 a demonstration of the, of as clear a clear a demonstration as anything could be that this was required in order to make payment for our sins, but it was of the same nature as the blood sacrifices of the Old Testament. I don't understand if if you say that Christ did it before creation and made full payment, then why would God accept those those animal animal blood? after Christ had already shed his blood. Excuse me, God is demonstrating through the killing of the animal. God is demonstrating how the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. Isn't that interesting? The yes, lamb was when slain. He came and, and these came. animals, the killing of those animals, demonstrated how Christ had made the payment, and then in order to intensify the picture in an enormous way, Christ himself came as the Lamb and demonstrated how he had suffered in making payment for, and how he had been killed in making payment for our sins. And you see, if, if how could, when we really think about it, we, theologically we made certain assumptions during the church age, uh, 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 because n nobody understood at all that Christ had died and God had not given us that information, that Christ had made the payment b before he ever created the world. But think about it. When uh, when uh, when uh, Abel, who is the, the first man that we know for sure that had become saved, in order for him uh, to die a child of God, his sins had to be forgiven. Now, on what basis could his sins be forgiven if Christ had not already died? Now, throughout the church age, the theologians made it. The only thing they could do is make an, a, a theological assumption. But it's an assumption. It is not taught directly like that in the Bible, namely that the efficacy of the payment that Christ made when he went to the cross is uh, throughout the church age, we assumed that he never physically, literally made the payment until 33 A.D. when he hung on the cross. But we uh, learned uh, the, the theological assumption that the efficacy of the cross reached back and picked up the Old Testament believers, like uh, like uh, uh, Abel and Moses and Enoch and and uh, Noah and so on. Those people that became saved. But that was a theological assumption. The fact is, we can ask the question very direct: On what basis could God forgive Abraham's sin if Christ had not already made? The pen, paid the penalty, but because before the foundation of the world he had paid the penalty of uh, that covered the sins of 
Abel and covered the sins of Abraham and Moses and David. Therefore, God could legitimately, legally forgive their sins, just like he can forgive our sin, because the payment has already been made. Now everything is harmonious. Everything fits together without having to make some kind of a theological assumption. But uh, wait, okay, but in Psalm 1610, that scripture you always quote, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, you know, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. That wilt, W-I-L-T, is in the future tense. It's not, it didn't, doesn't say... Did well, now be careful of those tenses, because you see, when God is doing parables, parables, he makes the parable... Uh, as if it is just happening, it's just happening, as because it is, it is a, uh, uh, or, or, or even that it's going to happen because it is, it is uh, illustrating something that has long ago, is in the process of happening, and so you can't, you can't, you. Uh, 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 sometimes we, we get a little bit too tied in with those tenses. We have to, first of all, examine the context. And the context of the whole Bible is very, very clear now that we've learned it, that Christ made the full payment before he ever created the world. There's all kinds of information that testify to that. And so... Uh, we then we know well. Okay, now we understand why why it is uh, written this way. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Well, Hello, Brother Camping. Yeah. Um, I, I had a question and a couple of interesting verses. Uh, Revelation twenty and eleven. Revelation 20? Yes, and 11, as in 2011, possibly. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works. Now here again, you see, we have a parable. God here is giving an illustration to, uh, describing his judgment plan. Now in this, in this illustration, in this three-dimensional uh, uh, demonstration of God's judgment plan, there's a, there's a, a throne. There's a throne. Somebody sits on that throne, and he is the judge of all the earth. And when we study the Bible, what does it mean to be the judge? It means to be the ruler, the ruler of all the earth, who sets up all the judgment programs and, and sees to it that they're all carried out. And, and he, uh, he is the one who is the ruler who has to protect those who need protection and so on. He, we go to the book of Judges and examine what the work of the judges, and there are several of them named there, and we find that it's way, way, way beyond that of just deciding someone is guilty or, or innocent of a crime. Secondly, we see that, that uh, the, uh, the, the uh, let's read it again, uh, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. Well, okay, that is God, of course. God is the judge. Uh, God is the ruler of all the world. He uh, definitely is. Uh, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Now, when did when do we stand before God? From the That's moment. From the moment uh, uh, that God knew us before the foundation of the world. We have stood before God because God knew us from the very beginning. And to stand before him, it isn't like we're just talking about standing before him at a moment of time at the end of our life. 
we stand before him before our whole life. God knows everything about us. And already before the foundation of the world, we have stood before him because uh, he knew who we were and he, out of the out of all those who he planned or that uh, that we were going to be born into this world or conceived in this world, uh, he chose those that he planned to save. We already have stood before him in that sense. And from the time we're conceived, we're conceived and born in sin. Now, he had, God set up a judgment program. That ju ju he's, he has the ruler. It wasn't that he's going to make a final uh, uh, judgment at, at the end of time. The, the, the judgment is constant. The wages of sin is death. Adam was told, in the day you eat of that tree, yet in the day you break the law of God, you will die. In other words, the law itself it brings condemnation, the law itself. And so we're condemned right from the moment that we're conceived and born in sin. Or even before we were in and Adam, we were already judged. And, and became spiritually dead. And that is added to and added to as we live out our life. Every sin brings further condemnation. And uh, it isn't required that we ever have to be examined by God. The law does that. God does it through his law as, as it goes along. And, and uh, the, in here, God is indicating he knows every sin. It's written in the book. And also there's a book of Tree of Life, or, or, or the, uh, of the, uh, those who were, uh, were not to be, uh, have to pay for their sin. And the, it's indicating that our names are not there if we are under the judgment of God. But thank you for calling. And so you see, this is a giant parable, a giant, uh, uh, three-dimensional illustration, demonstration of what God's whole judgment plan. And that began already before the foundation of the world. But now we're going to pause for a minute. Shall we take our next call? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping? Yes. Yes, I have a couple questions here for you. Uh, first one is, is, uh, I'm a gentleman that's a little older and I've been looking on websites and meeting women, uh, and, and, and churches and, and different places and I find that 99% of all the women that I've been meeting have been divorced. And my question to you is, can I pursue any of these women in divorce? Because it seems like every woman out there has been divorced. Well, the fact is, you see, about 50 years ago, I remember this very distinctly because uh, I became part of that action in the church I belonged to. Up until that time, uh, oh, no, they by the church understood correctly from the Bible there was not to be divorced for any reason. And you could visit almost any church and you would, you would find that there were virtually no people in that congregation that were divorced. Uh, they were simply instructed to uh, patiently work out their marriage. Their, or if, if worse came to, uh, absolutely worse came to worse, they could separate, but there could not be divorce. But then about 50, let me see, it was a little more than that, maybe 55, three years ago or so, uh, 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 the kind of denomination that I belong to, which was a very conservative denomination, they decided that we have to let the, uh, uh, loosen this up a little bit and allow divorce in case it was a, a really uh, a violent situation of fornication. And I remember I happened to be a part of the action. I gave my uh, uh, assent to that because that's all I understood. I trusted the theologians in our denomination that they really knew what they were talking about. 
And uh, but then it went from bad to worse. It started out where just a few people could get divorced for very, very, very limited reasons. But today you can get divorced for almost any reason. Uh, you can get married again after divorce. Preachers get divorced. Preachers get married again. In other words, the church guided the world into the situation to believe divorce is not wrong at all. We have misunderstood the Bible in the past. It is not wrong. And so the marriage institution has been pretty much totally destroyed, almost totally destroyed. And uh, that, of course, is one giant evidence that mankind have, is mocking God. They could care less about the Bible. They know more than God. In fact, it almost amazed me that that God waited so long to end it. But now we see that we're less than two years from the end. And no wonder the, the whole family has been destroyed. God had put very careful uh, laws in the Bible to protect the family, to protect the husband, to protect the wife, to protect the children, to protect the whole institution of marriage. And that's gone. That protection has been thrown away by what? Beginning in the churches that had the Bible. Oh, my, my. How could it be any worse than that? Well, Mr. Quinn, I just can't make my, my first question was is that I'm, I'm, I've never been married, and I wanted to know that all these, every woman I meet has been divorced. So my question was, is, is am I allowed to pursue these women that have been divorced? Is that okay? No, no, no. It's, oh, okay. You, you have to, you reckon, uh, you're, it's a sin, it's contrary to the law of God to, for a divorced person to get married. So you don't want to be a part of that. But I can tell you something else. You know, if you are still looking for someone that might work, just remember, you have less than two years, and to be to meet somebody, find somebody, meet somebody, become acquainted with them, and nobody should rush ever rush into a marriage. I doubt whether you could ever accomplish that in the little bit of time that is left. It's far better to get your focus on where am I in regards to this coming. May 21, 2011, when the whole world comes to an end. Now, why think about the marriage at this point in history? It is, okay. it is, it's really way too late. Well, I just, I'm just saying that every woman that I, that that seems to be available has been divorced unless they're teenagers. Right. So it it's almost impossible. It, yeah, it isn't quite that bad, but it's almost that bad. Yeah, I got a second question. Uh, when no one was building this boat up, I hear I hear a lot of stories and a lot of people talking, and I know it's not in the Bible about how people laughed at Noah at that time when he was building the boat, and also that people were screaming and trying to get in the boat at the last time when the floods are coming. Where, was, where does all this information come from? Well, that information is not not uh, is not uh, written in the Bible. It's it's just that. It's very easy to imagine this. First of all, here is this prophet who claims he's got a message from God building a huge boat, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 30 feet high, on dry land. He's been, he's been at this for more than 100 years. How crazy can you be? And he's insisting that there's going to come a flood and destroy the whole earth. Why, that's, that's nonsense. And so we can speculate, of course. It doesn't write this, but we know how people think. And you can see that they're, they're looking upon him as a crazy man. And the fact that nobody except his immediate family listened to him uh, means that that the whole world was was uh, uh, contrary in their thinking. Then, once the waters came, 
Well, first of all, the waters rose so fast that if they did any screaming, it was very short, maybe an hour or two. But they were they were uh, drowning almost immediately. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Mr. Camping, sir, great to speak to you, first-time caller. Um, two things. First is a comment. Um, the woman that called about blood sacrifices, uh, I think the key to understanding that <clears throat> is blood sacrifices are for the benefit of us, the sinners. They have no benefit to God whatsoever. They're for us to learn from. And Jesus told us that uh, if we don't understand earthly things, we'll never understand heavenly things. So I think that's the key to understanding that. But I need your help, sir. The um, meaning, spiritual meaning of Joseph of Arimathea um, assisting Jesus in carrying the cross, can you help me out to understand that? Well, this, uh, Joseph of Arimathea didn't carry the cross. He is the one who asked for the uh, or who's, uh, let's see, Joseph there, it was his, it was his grave that Jesus was buried in, the body of Jesus was put in, but there was another man, Simon, Simon who I'm sorry, yes. did carry the cross, right. and that is, does not mean at all that he assisted in making the pay, payment in any way, demonstrating that mankind somehow assisted in the payment. The payment had to do with what happened when Christ had been nailed and he's been become a curse and and uh, he has been stripped of his clothing. He is he is shamed in the eyes of everybody and then finally he dies and that is all that all has to do with with the payment for the sin. But it it does demonstrate that in this world uh, or uh, Christ uh, suffered uh, 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 very greatly uh, as he demonstrates his payment, but we all suffer if we are a child of God. In fact, the Bible uses language that we complete the suffering of Christ. When Christ, when Christ uh, was preaching, uh, for example, they ridiculed him and mocked him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. It simply is is underscoring uh, the uh, how how first of all the how the, how the dreadful payment he was making weakened him, but uh, uh, so that he needed help. But the payment was the fact that he shed his blood, that he actually died. That was where the payment was finally made, and the fact that he was shamed. Now the fact that. He, he was carrying a cross. That is not the shame in itself. So, so one of the things we should think about is that it's not a, the physical death, and that's what Simon represents, the fact that if, if Jesus is God, he doesn't need help. So if he needs help physically, the physical part of it was not the most important thing. It had nothing thing. to do with making payment for sin. Okay, very good. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Um, Mr. Camping, when I look at the book of Jonah, and the the very first, uh, Jonah 1.1, 1, 1, uh, it says, The word of the Lord came unto Jonah. And then uh, it, Jonah 2.6, The word came unto the king of Nineveh. So, from, correct me if I'm wrong, from what I understand in the Old Testament, when the Old Testament says the word of the Lord came to a person, that's the salvation. Would, would, I, would I be correct? What comes to a person, isn't that salvation? No, the word of the Lord, see, in Jonah 1.1, 1, 1, it says, when now the word, word of the Lord came... So, unto Jonah. So, yeah. that, so the Jonah was saved, and then he was sent to Nineveh. Yeah. No, first the that, salvation uh, had to come me, to him uh, first. Uh, excuse me. When the word came to Jonah, that does not prove that he was saved. The word came to Balaam in Numbers 22, and he was a wicked soothsayer. But the word came to him, 
that he had to prophesy concerning Israel. And they were beautiful prophecies. That doesn't mean that, a, that Balaam was saved. It doesn't mean that Jonah was. Now, Jonah probably was saved. The evidence seems to in, indicate that, but not because the word of the Lord came to him. The word of the Lord can come to uh, to a donkey, and it, Balaam's donkey repeated what God had given that donkey to say. Now, when a word of the Lord comes to us, that doesn't mean we become saved. We become saved when God applies uh, his word to our uh, to our life, giving us a brand new resurrected soul. And he can only do that in the life of someone who, before the foundation of the world, before creation, he had already made payment, full payment for all of the sins of that person. But at some point in that person's lifetime, either as a little baby or any time until the moment before he dies, he, you know, he has to apply the Word of God to that person's life and prepare him for his entrance into heaven. It begins with receiving a brand new resurrected soul, and then all that is finally left is the uh, we're getting a brand new resurrected body, which we will all receive in a little less than two years uh, on the day of the rapture, May 21, 2011. Well, I understand the whole process. I've been listening to to you for quite some time, and, I, and you're a very good teacher. And, um, and I do have to really say you are a very, very gifted teacher. Um, which I have learned a lot through you. Well, it's the Lord teaching me, but you have uh, done a very good job. But the, the book of Jonah, I'm looking because <clears throat> because I think we can, we we kind of give some credit to Jonah and the people of Nineveh. But the way I see it, it's the Lord Himself that has done it. That's why Jonah says in in two nine, salvation is of the Lord. So I think we have to be very careful not to give Jonah any credit. Or, or giving, even the king or me. anybody. It's, it's, we have to see clearly that it's all the work of the Lord in Jonah and in the king well, and in all the people. Uh, excuse me, who has given Jonah the credit? The credit isn't going to Jonah. This is God's whole dealing, just like the flood. The credit doesn't go to Noah, it goes to God. Just like Judgment Day and the rapture, that all... Uh, the credit doesn't go to people, it goes to God. Who is who is trying to give Jonah the credit? He was simply uh, very reluctantly, as a matter of fact, very reluctantly, he is, he is being obedient to God. He, first of all, ran away from God and, and uh, because he didn't like the uh, task that God had assigned to him. And, and even when even after he had uh, warned the people of Nineveh and they sat in sackcloth and ashes, he sat outside of the city on that day when they were supposed to be destroyed, and he was very unhappy because the city was not destroyed. So it's not a matter of giving Jonah the credit. It is simply reading what happened to the Ninevites because that's us. That's us. We are the, the whole world is the Ninevites, and are we going to follow their plan of a broken and a contrite heart and pleading to God for mercy and uh, and uh, turning away from our sins as best we can, or are we going to pay no attention as the people of, of uh, uh, Noah's day did? They paid no attention, and they were all destroyed in the flood. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, if God gives you a, a new resurrected body, are you? is it possible that you could sin after that? Oh, no. The new resurrected body, we, we are, when we get into it, uh, the new heaven and the new earth will never, never, never be tested by God again like Adam was. We'll never, never sin again forever and ever and ever. I'll tell you, the future is so brilliant, 
so absolutely brilliant for those who are are the saved ones uh, that that forever and ever we will be reigning with Christ and never again experience any sin or any of the things that we've experienced here on this earth. And and because it's the same God who created this earth, who creates the new heaven and the new earth. And my, what a beautiful earth this was. Well, uh, the same God uh, can go on creating even more beautiful things and more wonderful things. And that is that is part of the, the judgment uh, process. Those who who uh, die uh, they they uh, they have uh, they don't uh, they don't have any opportunity for that new heaven and that new earth now most of them don't know that they are going to uh, have that that except those who are entering into the day of judgment thinking that they're going to be the ones that will be raptured they will be confronted with that knowledge that they are that they have lost that possibility, and that is part of the judgment process. That they can't have that, but uh, but I was I was talking about here on earth. Here on earth, when you've been when God gives you the the change of spirit, can you sin after that? Well, when He gives us a new spirit, that means He gives us a new soul, a new soul, and it means now that there is a tremendous change in our life interest. Our interest now is is focused heavily, heavily, intensively on the Word of God because in our new soul we do not want to sin. We're but is it possible? Is it possible? We can still sin because we have a body that still lusts after sin. But if we sin after we have received our new resurrected body, and God gives us uh, uh, examples of this, like David committed great sin. He committed uh, fornication with Bathsheba and had her husband murdered. And But then you read Psalm 51, and you read his intense remorse because of that. In other words, if a true believer sins, it is, he feels awful about it, and he just doesn't want uh, to continue. And if he finds that he is, has to struggle, he knows he's got to go to God and pray for help. Pray for help, oh Lord! Uh, you and 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 it, hopefully the Lord will send chastisement. And wow, that will be big time. And he'll know why he has the chastisement. It'll help him with that besetting sin. Okay. Uh... Other question I got is I I heard a couple fellows call in and say stuff like they're lonely and uh, you know that since that they've turned to God and went with your preaching that they've been abandoned. I've had somewhat that similar experience, uh, and your your advice is just to turn to the Lord and. But I, I was just wondering, do, do you really understand what it's like to be abandoned by all the people and be by yourself all the time? I mean, it's 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 not a good thing, and and it, it's it's hard to bear. Well, no, I, let me. It's not, it's not what I understand. It's what the Bible says, and the Bible, you know, it's for nineteen nineteen hundred and fifty five years throughout the church age. The Bible was recommending that we be part of a congregation and that we have fellowship there. And and that looked like a very nice uh, situation. But the fact is that that uh, our focus then came, was put upon other people, not upon God. And uh, the, the spiritual situation was dismal. Very, very, very few people ever became saved throughout the church age. Now, God, in this final wrap-up, only the final 17 years of the history of the world, he's saving a great many people compared with the few that he had saved throughout the 13 years, thousand years previously. He is saving 
a great many people, but it's just between God and that individual or that individual and God. Now, we have a whole new uh, situation. We're not commanded to seek uh, help from each other because that's what got us into trouble throughout the church age. We're to seek help from God. Our focus is on the Word of God. And the, the question is, is God sufficient? Well, we think not, because we've never had a really an experience of testing God. But the fact is, God is sufficient. It, would he be telling us to, uh, to fellowship with him? Would he, uh, when he has given us, first of all, his word, we have to understand. And we've never been taught this. We've never, this has never become a, a part of our life. That every time we read a verse in the Bible, that is a message to me from God. That's big time. This is a message to me from God. And, uh, and secondly, God said, pray without ceasing. That is, don't ever hesitate to enter my throne room with your prayers. And we've never been accustomed to that. We've never, we've never explored that possibility to any high degree. And now we can. We can start talking to God again and again, knowing that this is what he wants us to do. And so, my, my, now, now we find enormous fellowship with God, but it comes slowly. We have to learn, just like we have to learn to find fellowship with others. But well, the well, real for all these people is that are that are that are for these poor people that are lonely, maybe you should establish some kind of uh, internet site or something where these people can get together and at least have companionship and, and through now, your excuse belief. Excuse me. Now you see your. You're, 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 you want to set up something that God has not set up. Okay. You are you are trying to find an answer. Uh, I'm just uh, uh, by, by the wisdom, excuse me, by the wisdom of man. And God has not established that. We have to learn it's me and God, God and me. Now, if we're not saved, oh, okay. Now we are going to be lonely. We're trying to do something that we're not uh, able to do. We really cannot find fulfillment if we're not a child of God. Uh, and for them, yes, they can so, so try to find other people and meet with them, and that's why uh, most people don't, or one of the reasons most people don't want to leave their churches, because they can't believe that they can have any happiness without other people. But the few that do become saved, and they're a relatively small percentage of all people, uh, they learn that I can have fellowship with God. The Bible is so important. It's so rich to me. Uh, because I know when I read that sentence, God is speaking to me. It has meaning for me. And I, in turn, can talk to God about that sentence and, or about my feelings or about my my misgivings or my anything, I can go to him again and again and know that he is listening, that he, uh, that he is, is uh, that I'm under his care, that he will never leave me nor forsake me. But until we're really a child of God, all of this sounds impossible. But I thank can. you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, hello, Mr. Campaign. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Uh, before I get to my question, uh, Mr. Campaign, uh, regards to that last caller, may, uh, maybe you could read Psalm 73, verse 25 and 26, some encouragement. Psalm 73. Verse 25 and 26. We read, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. This is the statement of a true believer who has learned how marvelous it is to have their trust entirely in Christ. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Oh, beautiful verses. And 
and I thank you, thank you for sharing them. But this this is what becomes more and more the portion, the, the, the experience, the situation of a true believer. But now what is your question? Is, uh, please go to Isaiah 10, verses 12 to 15. In Isaiah 10, verse 12? Yes. All right, let's 15, look at that. Possible. Isaiah 10, verse 12. Wherefore, uh, wherefore it shall come to pass. In fact, uh, hold on, I'll be right back with you right after this message. We have a caller on the line who's asked us to look at Isaiah chapter 10, verses 12 to 15. Wherefore it shall come to pass that when, Je when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, that is, when God is finished with his work of salvation, of building the kingdom of God, uh, Mount Zion and Jerusalem really have to do with the kingdom of God. I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria. Now, the king of Assyria here is a picture of Satan who comes as an angel of light and whose ministers are ministers of righteousness. And he, Satan really believes that he is doing a marvelous job because look at the mega churches. Look at how great they are. Look at how people, how happy they are in those churches. Uh, 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 but God is saying uh, uh, he will punish the st fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. The fruit are those who are in the churches under his authority and his uh, the uh, and he himself, the glory of his high looks. For he saith, by the strength of my hand, of my will, I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent, and I have removed the bounds of the people, and have robbed their treasures. Now what he what he has done is he has he has said, look, why are you inhibited? by the, just the laws of the Bible. Uh, 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 let's set those aside, and, and uh, I'll give you the laws that are much, much more uh, open. Uh, you can have a lot more freedom. That's why, for example, uh, we have no, ma no marriage rules anymore. Uh, the, the bounds have been put away. The treasure of the marriage... Uh, laws has all been robbed. It's gone. I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand has found as a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathers the eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth. There was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. In other words, I am the ruler of the churches and of the world. And incidentally, Satan has been installed as the ruler, not because of his wisdom or because of his strength or ability. God simply placed him there as he is using him to prepare the church, churches and the world for judgment day. Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith, or shall the saw magnify himself against him that shaketh it? as if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood. Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, uh, uh, send his fat ones leanness, and under his glory he shall kindle a burning fire like the burning of a fire. In other words, the whole business is under the authority of God, and God has assigned the task to Satan, typified here by the king of Assyria, other places by the king of Babylon or the king of Egypt. He has, he has assigned Satan the task of, of ruling in order to prepare the churches and the world for judgment day. Uh, but and Satan himself 
thinks it's because he's so smart, because he has finally won. And uh, frankly, the fact is, it will all end in judgment. That's like verse verse 15. Could this also be talking about uh, the first the people that are trusting their own works for salvation too? Is that possible, or am I wrong there? Well, uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, if we are under, if we're not saved, we're under the authority of Satan. We are, we are, uh, we follow what he is pleased with. He's very pleased with the fact that we're trusting in our own work because that way he is destroying, he is destroying the kingdom of God. That's his, that's his long suit is to destroy the kingdom of God, so that does fit in. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Campen. Um, this is a, maybe a long um, passage, just slightly long. This is this refers to um, uh, I, the, judges, I, the Judges 11 and verse 19. It's about Jephthah when he vowed a vow. Judges eleven nineteen. Sorry, Judges eleven verse twenty nine. Uh, verse uh, yeah uh, eleven oh. about uh, Jephthah. Right. Uh, verse twenty nine. Thirty four. We read the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh and passed over Mizpah of Gilead and from Mizpah to Gilead. He passed over unto the children of Ammon. Oh, well, and it goes on. Uh, the, uh, um, I don't want to read all. Well, let me just read them a minute. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto Jehovah and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth out of the doors of my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be Jehovah's, and I will offer for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and Jehovah delivered them into his hands. And he smote them from uh, Aurora, even till thou come to Minith, even twenty cities, and under the plain of the vineyards, and with a very great slaughter. Thus the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. And Jephthah came to Mizpah unto his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances. She was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter. And when he said, and it came to pass when he saw her, that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou, thou art one of them that trouble me, for I have opened my mouth unto the Jehovah, and I cannot go back. And she said unto him, My father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto Jehovah, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. For as much as Jehovah hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of Ammon. All right, now what is your question? The well, question is, would this be parallel to the Lord Almighty having to sacrifice his own son? Or would, would that have two meanings, meaning it it ab a vow of vow? It yeah. absolutely is. A, par a parable or a, and parallel, he, God is demonstrating. Now, we stand in horror when we read this, that Jephthah, who was the victorious uh, commander of the armies of Israel, uh, now had to, had to sacrifice, had to kill his only daughter. Notice how God is really making a point, for she was, uh, his only child. Beside her, he had neither son nor daughter. Uh, God is really rubbing that in. And so it's like God is saying, 
I, in order to get victory over the enemies of mankind, uh, that enemy was sin, I had to sacrifice my only son, my only son. And now you think it is, it is uh, horrendous, horrible, to that Jephthah had to sacrifice his daughter. Well, now that gives you a tiny little bit of a sense of what a sacrifice it was for God to sacrifice his only, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Did Jephthah do wrong by vowing a vow? Was Jephthah wrong in vowing a vow? In a vow? Oh, absolutely okay. not. Absolutely okay. not. This was okay. a serious vow. It's, yeah. And it's, it's significant. You know, you notice the daughter's reaction. Right. She knew that she was going to die. And yeah. yet she was perfectly willing because her dad had done this, just like Christ was perfectly willing to be our our atonement, uh, to give his life in order to make payment for our sins. Yes. Also, one one final question uh, is is would that be a custom of um, a victorious person like just for um, having to vow a vow to the Lord God? You may, was that a custom? In that the, was I, not a custom. Uh, why he did that? Why he did that? That's his business. But he did, it and is. God is, of, uh, of course. We know why he did it. God is setting him up as because God is in charge of this whole business. First of all, here is Jephthah. He was an illegitimate uh, man. He he was despised be, uh, uh, because of that. And yet, why would they come to him to be their leader? God had guided Jephthah's life so that he gave evidence of being a very superior commander. And so they he brought them to Jephthah, and then God guided Jephthah to make this kind of a vow. Then God guided the enemy, the, the fighting, so that Jephthah won a very, very de definite victory. And then God uh, guided Jephthah, uh, or guided Jephthah's daughter, so that she would be the first coming out of the house. Uh, in those days, the animals uh, were part of the household, and he uh, he was thinking of a of a rooster or a uh, lamb or a calf or something coming out. And lo and behold, it's his daughter. God set the whole thing up to be a tableau, just like he did uh, in Revelation 20 when he demonstrated his whole judgment process. Here he demonstrated as he did when he brought Christ here to demonstrate on Golgotha how he be, was shamed and how he was cursed and uh, uh, became a curse in the eyes of God and how he, how, how he died finally and so on. Uh, all of this is the way God has carried out his law and written about it. Remember, this yeah. was written in the Bible by God. God wants us to read this so that we can have a little more understanding uh, and appreciate a little bit better what Christ went through. Yes, this is. And thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. Can you explain to me what oil and wine uh, means in Ephesians 6, verse 6? Well, oil represents normally, or, or in Ephesians 6, verse 6. Let's look at that. Let's go turn to that. Ephesians 6, Not with our service, as men pleases. So let me start with verse 5. 
not uh, servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ during the will of God from the heart. Oh, this is not the verse you want, is it? It doesn't uh, no. talk about oil and wine. I'm sorry, you'll have to find your verse, and then we'll then we'll uh, look at it. And shall we go to our next call? Okay, please? thank you. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, uh, Brother Camping, good evening. Yes. Yes, yes sir. Um, I, uh, I've listened to you for my whole life, and uh, I just want to say you've been a blessing to my family uh, as I was growing up and also to, to our family presently. Um, I have a couple of questions real quick. Um, the first one has to do with Revelation 1, verse 7. Revelation 1, verse 7. There yes, we sir. find where God says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. In other words, so be it. Now, what is your question? What is your question? And I agree with you having to do with when you're dead, you're dead, and there's nothing else after concerning uh, hell and punishment. My question is, uh, in this verse, it says that, um, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Now, that would seem to me it would include some of those who were unsaved at the cross, who, who, who put Christ up on the cross and, uh, and uh, crucified him. So I'm wondering, there must be some other kind of um, resurrect, or, like, resurrection to damnation so that every eye can see him. Am well, I first, right of all, that? first of all, you're t- tying this to... Uh, and also those who pierced him. Now, who really caused Christ's death? Was, was it the Jews? Was it the Roman soldiers? Well, they were they were active in the process, but were, what was the basic reason that Christ had to die? On whose behalf was it? Was it on behalf of the wicked of the world? No, it was on behalf of the true believers. If he had not died for us, we would have no salvation. We are the ones who pierced him. We are the the cause of him uh, uh, dying. Uh, and and the wicked they they were not the cause. They they happened to be instruments that carried it out. But but the fact is, he was he had to go to the cross. He had to die in order that we could have our sins paid for. And uh, so. Uh, we are the ones who pierced him already before the foundation of the world. Now we didn't know <laughs> it was all, but it was all part of God's plan. And so very good. There was no problem here. And, and my, thank you very much. My second question is Revelation twenty verse ten. Revelation twenty verse ten. There we read. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night. Now the King James translation has forever and ever. Uh, uh, that's a, that is a possible translation of the word for, the Greek word that translates as for, but it will not fit the context of the Bible. It is. It is. Uh, it, it is a word that it can also be translated to, and that fits the context. To, in other words, the devil is uh, the the day and night, and uh, goes on until the last day of the day of judgment. That's October 21 in uh, 2011. And then the whole earth and the whole universe is destroyed by fire. We have come to ever and ever. That is to eternity future. And, and 
the devil will be tormented uh, all through the day of judgment. But once we come to eternity, they're gone. They've been totally annihilated. Yes. Uh, have you ever thought, sir, that um, the lake of fire that God might be speaking in an in even deeper parable, that the lake of fire here could be the churches and that the false prophet are the, are the ministers and that and no, uh, the beast no. is the church and so forth. Is that a possibility? No. The, the lake of fire identifies with what we read in Hebrews, that God is a consuming fire. And, in, and, and it ties in with Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, where we read in verse 10, The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. That, that is our, that'll happen the last day of the day of the Lord. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. It's like one great lake of fire. God is a consuming fire. It is all gone. They are there, as we read in Isaiah 65, they will not be remembered or come into mind ever again. Okay, thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call? Please welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello. I have a question about the 153 days. About the 153 days of the Day of Judgment? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the, the Bible defines this as hell for five months? It defines this as, the, not as hell, it is defines this as the Day of Judgment. We call it hell, but hell actually is death, the grave. And it is the time when uh, that during that period of 153 days, billions of people, uh, more than 6 billion people, will enter that period. And during that period, from the first moment of it until the last, will be dying left and right. There will be bodies everywhere. It will be a time of absolute horror, absolute horror on this earth. And it's... It, by the end of the five months, and finally, whoever is still living will be finally destroyed by fire. Okay, in regards to Revelation 1, verse 18, I was wondering, what is the purpose of the keys to hell if it is permanently locked? Well, the purpose of uh, Revelation 1, verse 18 uh, I am he that liveth, and am dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and have the keys of hell and of death. That, and the, that is the, de the keys of the grave and death. Hell is a synonym for the word grave, of, grave, of the grave and death. And grave and death is simply a repetition of the fact that that is absolutely going to happen and soon that there will be this, and, and uh, it is God who makes the decision who is going to die. Nobody else does. God does. God makes the decision who is going to die. And therefore, he has the key to death. Uh, if uh, we were created, we were not created to die. We were created in Adam to live forever. But it is God who has the key to death and the grave, so that all through the 13,000 years of history, there has been death already, and, uh, and it will be finished up in its most horrible fashion during the Day of Judgment. And thank you for calling in, Sherry. And shall we take our next call, please? Yes. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hi, Harold. Yeah. Hi, how are you today? Very well, thank you. All right. I have a comment I'd like to make uh, about a verse, and then I'd like to ask a question, if I may. Yeah. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Acts 1, verse 11, we read, which also said, 
and, and while they were looking steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, this is the ascension of Jesus back into heaven, and he is being witnessed by the apostles. Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now, what is your question? You see, the... Uh, this uh, in like manner. That's a that is a big. Uh, there's lots of leeway. What does it mean in like manner? Does it mean that he's going to come down in the same physical body that they saw him go up? Well, not necessarily. That isn't in like manner. Simply means that he is coming again. He is coming, and and it, it's not describing what his appearance will be. In fact, nobody's going to see him literally. They're going to know that he has come because of the events that are taking place, the rapture and the day of judgment, uh, all the horrible things that are happening. We must remember that we have almost two years left, and this kind of information is going to be increasingly talked about and talked about and talked about everywhere in the world. Right now, it is, it's, uh, not, there aren't that many that even know about it, but increasingly there will be more and more people that know about it, and, and God is priming us. He's allowing us to understand this so we can explain it very clearly, and, uh, and it will, uh, they will know that as we approach May 21, and everyone in the world will know, as we approach May 21, 2011, what is supposed to happen? What did the Bible say? It's, they, you remember, it means that there's going to be a great earthquake. It means that all the graves are going to be thrown open. It means that we're going to see people being caught up in, into the sky and disappearing in the sky. I wonder if that's going to happen. And then they see it happen. They'll know it has happened. Christ has come. He's done all the things he said he would do. Uh, and that means we too are going to be destroyed because we're left behind. Yes, Harold. That's exactly how I interpreted the verses. Now, I have a question, if I may. Yeah. Yes, my question is, um, I agree that we can know as uh, the children of God, as, as he is revealing to us in these last days, that we can know the I'm day. Sorry. I'm sorry. We're, we got too late. I'll have to say good night. I'm sorry. And shall we? Uh, and so... Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Family stay.